All right, can you guys see the PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay. All right, so in each PowerPoint, um, I talk about some of the important things and some of the stuff. I'll have you read it um, and I'll let you know. So if you have your Kindle, you can either highlight it or uh, you can make notes and go back to it. So today we're going to talk about the head and neck anatomy. Now, sometimes people say why, and I'll go into that in a minute because we're all about teeth. At this time, I'm going to ask you guys to mute your mic, and that way we don't have background noises. And if I have, uh, if you have any questions, open up your mic. If I ask you any questions, then open up your mic so that way um, we don't have that background static. So the learning objectives are in your Kindle. You can um, go over it. Uh, mainly, you're doing the uh, terminology on your Survey Monkey, and then the rest we're going to identify and locate. So as I mentioned, um, we're going to talk about the head and neck anatomy, and it provides you as the dental assistant the ana anatomical basis for the clinical practice of dental assisting. So we'll learn about muscles, lymph nodes, bones of the skull and the face, and even the salivary glands. Um, you will also learn about the muscles that create your facial expressions and those that help you open and close your mouth and swallow your food. So there are different parts of the head. It's divided into regions. We have, and I'm gonna go to the actual picture so you guys can see. We have the frontal, the prior, parietal, the temporal, zygomatic, infraorbital, the occipital, the mental region, buccal region, oral region, nasal region, and orbital region. Now, later when we talk about some teeth, they're going to also refer to some of these regions, like a surface that we're going to learn is called the buccal region. And if you look at this diagram here, the buccal is uh, facing the cheek. OK, and we'll get into more of the different other surfaces. But again, these are some of the regions. Now, the bones of the skull are divided into two sections. We have the cranium that has eight bones that cover and protect the brain. And then we have the face that consists of 14 bones. Now, back to the bones, we have single and paired. Now, the single ones are your frontal, occipital, sphenoid, and ethmoid. And the pair are your parietal and your temporal. And here is a picture of it. Now, in your Kindle, please look at the figure. OK, it might be on figure 9.2. It might be a little different than my PowerPoint, but you do definitely have the picture. Kind of look at it a little bit better, and that way you can see where everything is. This is the front view of the skull. And here is the back view, or what we call the posterior. And this is like if we split the mouth in half, and we're looking at the top portion of the mouth. Like we broke their jaw in half and looking at what we call the maxillary arch, which is our upper arch. And then everything going through the sinus nose, uh, the nose to the sinuses and things like that. So that's that. Now the bones of the face, the bones visible on the anterior view of the skull include the following. You have the lacrimal, nasal, vomer, nasal concha, zygomatic, maxilla, and maxilla is the upper jaw, mandible is the lower jaw. Those are the two out of everything else that's most important for us because we deal mostly, of course, with the teeth. So here again is the maxillary or maxilla. So that's the top. So they're showing you uh, the palatine process, the transverse palatine, the greater palatine, the horizontal plate, the medial palatine, and the incisive foramen. We'll get into a little bit more of each one in a little bit. 
but uh, this is again your upper jaw, the maxillary, okay? And then this is your mandibular or mandible. So this is the lower jaw. And this is the only jaw that moves. The maxillary does not move when you talk, when you chew. Uh, pretty much only your lower jaw moves. Now this is a picture from you looking in to the mandibular. So from the inside where the tongue would be. And again, Please look in your Kindle so you can identify it a little bit better. I'm not going to go through each uh, one here. Uh, we will touch on the things that are the most important. Here's the mandible from the left and the front. So this is what the jaw looks like, side view. And here is if we if they broke the jaw in half, what it would look like again from the tongue section and what the bone looks like from the inside. A lot of these a lot of times when they put bones like this, it's usually from cadavers, uh, which is dead people, okay, um, that have basically given their bodies to uh, science for science for research. So sometimes some of these are drawings and some of these are actual bones. This is actual. So let's go into a little bit more of a couple of bones. So hyoid bone, it's unique because it does not articulate with any other bone. It's suspended between the mandible and the larynx. If it functions as a primary support for the tongue and other muscles. It's shaped like a horseshoe and consists of a central body with two lateral projections. Its position is noted in the neck between the mandible and the larynx, and it is suspended from the styloid process of the temporal bone by two stylohoid ligaments. The postnatal development. So at birth, the cranial vault is large and the cranial base and face are small. The face lacks vertical dimension because the teeth have not erupted yet. We'll get to a picture of that soon. At a uh, fusion of bones, several bones of the skull have not fused as single bones at the time of birth. The frontal bone is separated by an interfrontal suture and various components of the temporal, occipital, sphenoid, and ethmoid bones will fuse during infancy and early childhood. The development of the facial bones, the mandible, at birth is present in two halves separated by the symphysis menti. During the first year of life, it fuses together. The maxilla is entirely filled with developing tooth buds. The vertical growth of the upper face is caused largely by dental alveolar development and formation of the maxillary sinuses. There's differences between male and female skulls. Generally speaking, female skulls tend to be smaller and lighter and to have thinner walls. The female forehead usually retains a rounded anterior contour and the teeth are smaller with rounded incisal edges. Male skulls are larger and heavier and have more rugged muscle markings and prominences. The male teeth are larger and more squared incisally and the forehead is flatter as a result of developing frontal sinuses which are larger in men. So here's what a fetal skull will start looking like when they're first developing. This is what they talk about the vertical uh, dimension is not there yet. What that means is uh, there because there's no teeth there's no vertical meaning that it's not open yet. Once teeth develop then they will get the vertical dimension. Here is a lateral view of the fetal skull and the posterior view. Again, look in your Kindle so you can identify everything. So this is what the stages of the postnatal development of the human skull looks like, starting from birth. So here's that there's no vertical dimension. So it looks like they're already old. When there's no teeth from birth all the way to the age, they lose their vertical dimension. From three years, six years and adult, when the teeth are there, the vertical dimension is there. Okay, so this is the, the stages. Now, 
before I continue, does anybody have any questions so far? No, ma'am. Okay. So are we supposed to be just following along with you or writing anything down? No, if you, you want to take notes, by all means, take notes. If you want to highlight, uh, because some of these uh, PowerPoint slides are going to answer a lot of your questions for your workbooks, your pretests. Uh, and if you've done it already, that's great. But if there's something that you're like, oh, interesting, you guys can highlight it on your own uh, or, you know, uh, jot down questions. And whenever uh, I break, like in the middle of the PowerPoint or at the end, you can ask me the questions. OK, good question. So we can go, we can be doing our workbook while you're giving our lesson. Absolutely. OK, I was just doing the other chart. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> because again, a lot of the questions are going to come from this PowerPoint. OK. And of course, whatever you don't find, you will find in your Kindle because it's the same thing in um, in your Kindle. OK, yes, ma'am. All right. Do we have access to the like to the PowerPoint? Uh, well, if you're on Microsoft Teams, once I finish, I'm recording it right now. You can play it back whenever you want. OK, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. So the TMJ is also known as temporal mandibular joints. And you're going to find this on each side of the head that allows for movement of the mandible for speech and mastication, which is chewing. It takes its name from the two bones that enter its formation, the temporal bone and the mandible. The capsular ligament is a fibrous joint capsule that completely encloses the TMJ. I'll be showing you a picture of all this in a few. The capsule wraps around the margin of the temporal bones, articular eminence, and articular fossa superior, superiorly. Inferiorly, the capsule wraps around the circumference of the mandibular condyle, including the condyle's neck. So articular space, this is the area between the capsular ligament and the surfaces of the glenoid fossa and condyle. The articular disc, the meniscus, is a cushion of dense specialized connective tissue that divides the articular space into upper and lower compartments. These compartments are filled with synovial fluid, which helps lubricate the joints and fills the synovial cavities. So here's a lateral view of the temporal mandibular joint. So your TMJ, again, um, some people, and we'll talk about this later, some people have problems with their TMJ, um, it, whether it locks, it hurts. Um, one of the reasons why is because of opening their jaw too wide. Uh, when they yawn, they exaggerate their yawn. And what happens is this mechanism here, here's the joint capsule that we just talked about. Okay. Here is the ligament right over here, the TMJ ligament. All right, and by the way, this is the temporal uh, bone that it's connected to, and this is the mandible. So if you come over here on this picture, it's locked in there. When you start exaggerating your movements of your jaw, again, whether it's uh, yawning, uh, opening your mouth wide, on occasion, you will take this out of its place. And once you continue doing that once too many, then it, it constantly slips out of place. Okay, so we want to really be careful with our TMJ because the last thing we need is that painful jaw uh, movement. A lot of people get headaches from it. They actually, a lot of people that um, have TMJ problems can hear the clicking, the popping. Okay, now if you already have that, then you already have issues. So you have to make sure again, that you make sure that you take care of your TMJ by not opening your mouth as wide uh, exaggerated or yawning exaggerated or chewing gum all day long or chewing on hard uh, things like ice or hard candy because this slips the TMJ out of its socket. Okay. Now, 
again, I just mentioned there's a hinge action. The first phase of mouth opening, only the lower compartment of the joint is used. There's a gliding movement. It allows the jaw to move forward or backward. It involves both the lower and upper compartments of the joint. The condyle and articular disc glide forward and downward along the articular eminence, which is the projection. The gliding movement, the protrusion is the forward movement of the mandible. The reversible of this movement is the backward movement of the mandible called retrusion. Lateral movement of the mandible occurs when the internal and external pyrigoid muscles on the same side of the face contract uh, together. So again, here's the mandible. They're showing you the mandible when its jaws closed, okay? When it's open and see how it rocks forward and when it's really wide open. So it really comes forward. So again, we want to keep this TMJ locked in here with the ligaments in, in its place and not let it slip out. Now, TMJ disorders. A patient may experience a disease process associated with one or both of the TMJs called a temporal mandibular disorder, TMD. It's complex. It involves such factors as stress, clenching, holding teeth tightly together for prolonged periods or bruxism, habitual grinding of the teeth, especially at night. So these are other things that can happen to your TMJ. Uh, people who are stressed, uh, tend to also clench or grind their teeth at night. Some people don't even know they're doing it because, of course, they're sleeping. But if anybody hears you, they will let you know that you're making an awful noise. Now, TMD can also be caused by trauma to the joy, systemic diseases so, such as osteoarthritis or wear due to aging. So along the lines, a lot of the elderly also have problems with their jaws. And of course, as we mentioned, if God forbid you get into a car accident or get hit in the mouth, you might do something to your jaw. And if you have arthritis, but if it's in the mouth, it's called osteoarthritis. Now, usually when you come into uh, the dentist's office, the first examination that the doctor does along with your teeth is he checks your jaws. He'll put his fingers on the side of your jaws and even you can do this and open and close. On the side, don't do it so so uh, wide, as I told you, okay? But you can put your two fingers on the side where your jaws lock, open and close a little bit, and you actually feel it. Now, if you hear pain or you have sounds or anything like that, definitely go to the dentist right away. You're not going to go to your medical doctor because your medical doctor is going to send you to your dentist. We do have devices. And we'll talk about this later, like mouth guards, um, TMJ guards, things like that, that can be made for people that do have bad TMJ disorder. So the symptoms are pain and they can go from uh, just, you know, a dull ache to a wide range of pain, joint sounds, clicking, popping or crepitus. OK, that's the cracking sound that may be heard in a joint. Uh, limitations of movement like trismus, that's the spasm of the muscles of mastication. It's the most common cause of restricted mandibular movement. Now you can also, uh, if you have a little TMJ problem, you can massage yourself in that area and then stop either talking or eating for a couple of hours and that kind of helps. Now the causes of TMJ disorder are often considered to be related to stress. Oral habits such as clenching the teeth or bruxism are important contributing factors. All the causes, as I mentioned, are accident, disease of the joint, or malocclusion. Malocclusion is when the teeth come together in a manner that produces abnormal strain on the joint and surrounding tissues. Another name for malocclusion is your teeth are all messed up. <laughs> And that's when you usually need uh, braces. Now, the muscles of the head and neck, to perform a thorough patient examination, it is necessary to know the location and action of many muscles of the head and neck. Malfunctions of muscles may be involved in malocclusions, which is your improper bite, TMJ disorder, and even the spread of dental infections. Now, 
there are seven main groups of muscles. They include the muscles of the neck, facial expression, mastication, tongue, soft palate, floor of the mouth, and the pharynx. So the major muscles of the neck, there's two. They're both superficial and easily palpated. You have the sternocleoid mastoid and the trapezius. These muscles can become painful when dental assistants use improper posture while assisting. So the muscles are down here, okay? If you guys are not sitting in your chair, right, and you have your neck all twisted trying to see what you're doing, at the end of the procedure, you will also have this problem. So the major muscles of facial expressions, you have the orbicularis oris. That's where you close and pucker your lips. The buccinator compresses the cheeks against the teeth and retracts the angle of the mouth. The mentalis raises and wrinkles the skin of the chin and pushes the lower lip up. And you have the zygomatic major. It draws the angles of the mouth upward and backward as in laughing. So if you're laughing, you're using your zygomatic major. If you're puckering your lips uh, for ladies that are putting on lipstick, they're using their orbicularis oris. If you are uh, sucking your cheeks, you're using the buccinator. And uh, of course, if you push your lower lip up, then you're using the mentalis. Now, the major muscles of mastications are your temporal, masseter, internal, and external thyroid. And here it is. Here's some of your mu major muscles here. Okay, so you want to see that in your Kindle. Now, muscles of the floor of the mouth are your digastric, your mylohoid, stylohoid, and geniohoid. And here's another picture from the view from the, uh, if you're looking above the oral cavity on the lower. So this is normally where your tongue would be. And behind your tongue, this is where the hyoid bone is. So this is where your tongue will be in this area. And then the rest are your muscles. Now I'll tell you right now, as far as dental assistance, when we are suctioning, these muscles are like the strongest. And you're gonna know because your hand starts getting tired from you suctioning, from you trying to move the tongue, from you trying to move the cheek. I mean, you, you just have to work your fingers and do a little bit of exercise. And we have a chapter on that. We'll get to that in um, later on in another mod. Now, the muscles of the tongue, intrinsic means within the tongue. Anytime we talk about in means inside, X means outside. So intrinsic, responsible for shaping the tongue during speech, chewing, and swallowing. Extrinsic, assists in the movement and function of the tongue. Your extrinsic are your genial glosses. It depresses and protrudes the tongue. Hyoglosses, retracts and pulls down the side of the tongue. Styloglosses retracts the tongue and palatal glosses elevates the tongue and pulls it slightly backward. So here is your extrinsic. Now you guys do this all the time. You just didn't know the names of it. So now you do. The muscles of the soft palate. You have your palatal glosses and your palatal pharynges. Give me one second here, please. Let me just tell my instructor. I'm on, I'm lecturing. I'll call you back. Okay, salivary glands produce saliva which lubricates and cleanses the oral cavity and aids in the digestion of food through an enzymatic process. Saliva saliva also helps maintain the integrity of two surfaces through a process of remineralization. Salivary glands are classified by their size as either major or minor. And uh, people that don't have saliva in their mouth, they tend to say that they have dry mouth. And we're going to be talking about that later also in a different mind, but that's called xerostemia. You're going to hear that a lot in the office. Now, here's the locations of your salivary glands. 
Many people didn't know they have so many, but we do. We have them under our tongue, okay? And some of these for uh, people who have active salivary glands, sometimes they just lift up their tongue and it squirts out. They don't mean to. Some people can do it um, on command. Some people just, it just squirts out. And then the other ones are pretty much like on the sides. So uh, towards the back of your mouth, sides of the cheek, all the way in the back. Okay, so that's where you have your salivary glands located. So again, we have to be careful too when we're suctioning. We don't want to hurt the salivary glands. Now there's two types of saliva. Serous, which is watery and mainly protein, and mucus, very thick and mainly carbohydrate. Minor salivary glands, smaller and more numerous than the major salivary glands, scattered in the tissues of the buccal, labial, and lingual mucosa. The soft palate, the lateral portions of the hard palate, and the floor of the mouth. And Ebner salivary gland is associated with the large circumvallate papilla on the tongue. Now, your major salivary glands are your parotid. That's where uh, Saliva passes from the parotid gland into the mouth through a duct called the parotid duct. We also call it the Stenson's duct. You have the submandibular salivary gland, which releases saliva into the oral cavity through Wharton's duct, which ends in the sublingual caruncles. And the sublingual salivary gland releases sal saliva into the oral cavity through the sublingual duct, also known as Bartholin's duct. Now, there are disorders of the salivary glands. I mentioned one to you already, which is dry mouth. Um, it could be a result in an increase in dental decay and problems in speech and chewing. And the other one is salivary stones. They are called sci sialids. They may block duct openings, preventing saliva from flowing into the mouth. If you know anything about like kidney stones, they hurt. So do these, okay? On x-ray, they show up like this, uh, some type of white uh, circle or dot. Uh, in the mouth, they look like this. Now, if you have these stones in the mouth, there could be a little surgery that can be done where we just cut a little opening and pop them out. Sometimes uh, they do reoccur and if they become painful, we can continue to remove them. If they're not painful, then we don't do anything unless they're blocking the flow of saliva. And usually they do. We really need saliva in the mouth because the saliva keeps the teeth nice and moist. It helps uh, flush whatever's in your mouth, keeps the tongue. If, if you ever had like dry mouth, usually when you have dry mouth, you get bad breath. So the saliva kind of help, helps that also. All right. Anybody has any questions before I continue? All right, I'm going to continue. So there's blood okay. supplies to the head and neck. It's very important to be able to locate the larger blood vessels of the head and neck because these vessels may become compromised by disease or during dental procedures such as local anesthetic injections. We have major arteries. We have the common one, which a lot of people know, the carotid artery. It arises from the aorta and subdivides in the internal and external carotid arteries. We have the internal, which supplies the blood to the brain and eyes, and external, which provides the major blood supply to the face and mouth. So again, internal, inside, external, outside. So the major arteries, again, are the external carotid, facial artery, lingual, maxillary, and mandibular. Then we have veins. We have the maxillary, retromandibular, external jugular, subclavian, facial, common facial vein, deep facial, lingual, and internal jugular veins. And here in red, you could see the arteries flowing through the skull. In blue, you could see the veins flowing. All right, so mainly this is more for the doctor because he has to give injections. It's just so you guys can see I want to go back to the arteries. If you look really close, these are the roots. These are the teeth and above them and below them are the roots of the teeth. The arteries are connected to each tooth. Okay. 
So when you have a toothache or a dental infection, that artery is pumping. It's like you, it has its own heartbeat because there's something wrong. And a toothache can affect the rest of your body because as you can see, if you look at the artery again, it is connected to the tooth. So if you have a dental infection and you don't take care of that dental infection, you are swallowing the infection, okay? It is going through your whole body. It's going through your arteries. So how do we take care of that infection? Antibiotics. Um, and of course, we'll talk about this a little bit more. Uh, also, the tooth can be extracted or the tooth can have a root canal. And again, we'll discuss that later. And then the veins. Okay, so they flow all through uh, the head. A lot of people can distinguish uh, migraines, toothaches, sinus infections, because since everything is like interconnected, some people have a hard time distinguishing if they're having a real toothache or a sinus headache or just a headache. Okay. Some people can tell just by their, uh, face being swollen. That's a symptom of a tooth. Now the nerves of the head and neck, so it's important for us to understand it, again, for the use of local anesthesia during dental treatment. And the nerves can also be related to certain conditions of the face, such as facial paralysis. So here's one, okay, facial paralysis. Um, one of the most common facial paralysis that we might see is called Bell's palsy. They don't really know exactly what has led to Bell's palsy. Um, I can tell you this because it runs in my family, my sister and my father, they both had it. Um, basically what, how it affected them was going from either hot to cold. Like, uh, for instance, if they were in AC house, air conditioned house and went out to an extremely hot temperature environment, like outside a hundred percent, a hundred degree that might affect it or um, for instance, my grandma was ironing and the steam was hitting her face from the iron and she decided to go into the freezer. She went into the freezer, got a blast of cold air and she got facial paralysis. Each one of them had what's called Bell's palsy. So even though there's not a definitive of what can cause this, um, in their case, it was always going from extreme hot to cold or cold to hot. Now, cranial nerves. There are 12 pairs of cranial nerves all connected to the brain. These nerves serve both sensory and motor functions. The cranial nerves are generally named for the area of function they serve and are also identified with the use of Roman numerals. So if you look at, at this uh, picture, and again, it's in your Kindle, we have 12, and each one will be numbered in Roman numerals. And then you also have this little um, uh, like box in your Kindle. It'll say figure 9.22 where you'll find this information, the Roman numerals, the names of the nerves, the type of the nerves, their sensory or motor, and what's the function of them. So some of them sense a smell, sense a sight, sight uh, the movement of the eyes, facial expressions, and so on and so forth. So please take a look at that. Now, the innervation of the oral cavity, the trigeminal nerve, is the primary source of innervation of the oral cavity. Uh, the trigeminal nerve is divided into three main branches, maxillary, mandibular, and ophthalmic. Ophthalmic is eyes. We'll discuss that later, too. Now, here is a picture. So take a look at this when you get a chance to, okay? all the label parts, so you have an idea. Now, the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve supplies the maxillary teeth, periosteum, mucous membrane, maxillary sinuses, and soft palate. It subdivides into the nasal palatine nerve, greater palatine nerve, anterior superior alveolar, middle superior alveolar, and posterior superior alveolar nerve. Now, I know a lot of these words are big, humongous, and you're like, holy smokes, I'm not gonna remember all this. That's okay. I'm explaining it to you again as we continue going on to chapters. We'll be breaking down the most important things. If you notice, though, 
Two words that I've been saying mostly on here is maxillary and mandibular. If you don't know anything else at the end of this chapter, please know that your maxillary is your upper jaw and the mandibular is the lower jaw. As far as a couple of other things you already know, you, you've been uh, educated since you've been born about your lips, your tongue, your cheeks, that you know. We'll talk later about surfaces on that uh, later on in the mod. Now the mandibular division, the buccal nerve supplies branches to the buccal mucosa membrane and mucoperiosteum of the mandibular molar teeth. The lingual nerve supplies the anterior two thirds of the tongue and gives off branches to supply the lingual mucous membrane and mucoperiosteum and the inferior alveolar nerve further divides, subdivides into the mylohoid, mylohoid nerve, mental nerve, incisive nerve, and small dental nerves that supply the molar and premolar teeth, alveolar process, and periosteum. So here are some other names that you need to know. Buccal, lingual, palatal, lingual, and buccal. Palatal is, so here's your maxillary, and on the top of your mouth, it, you guys might know it as the roof of your mouth, but the correct name is palatal. On the tongue side, where all, uh, all the surfaces of your teeth face towards the tongue, that is your lingual. On the cheek side, all the surfaces facing towards your cheek on your teeth are called the buccal. So again, we'll continue talking about that. But again, when you get a chance, look at this picture. Now, the lymph nodes of the head and neck a dental profession must examine and palpate the lymph nodes. So usually the dentist does this when he has his first appointment with the patient. He checks their lymph nodes to see if it's enlarged because it may indicate infection or cancer. The lymph nodes for the oral cavity drain intraoral structures such as the teeth as well as the eyes, ears, nasal cavity, and deeper areas of the, of the throat. The structure and function of lymph nodes are small and round or oval stru structures located in lymph vessels. The major sites of lymph nodes include cervical in the neck, axillary under the arms, and inguinal in the lower abdomen. The lymph nodes of the head are classified as superficial near the surface or deep. So there are five groups, occipital, retroauricular, anterior auricular, superficial par parotid and facial nodes. So here is where you will find your superficial lymph nodes of the head. So take a look at this picture also. Again, Dr. Palpate's right on the side of the neck to see if they're swollen or not. Some, by the way, some people, you don't even have to palpate. They'll come in with a swollen uh, neck like a golf size ball, or I've even seen it bigger, and you're like, you have a problem with your lymph nodes. But of course, we do not diagnose. We do not diagnose. That is the doctor, the dentist that will diagnose. We look at it. The doctor might say, what's going on? And you're going to be like, doc, you need to see this. Their lymph nodes are out of control. Now, Deep cervical lymph nodes are located along the length of the internal jugular vein on each side of the neck, deep to the sternocleoid mastoid muscle. So again, when you get a chance, take a look at this picture here, and it shows uh, the deep cervical lymph nodes. Now, if you have something called lymphodenopathy, that's when a patient has an infection or cancer in a particular region. The lymph nodes in that region will respond by increasing in size and becoming very firm. It can also increase in both the size of each lymphocyte and the overall cell count in the lymphoid tissue. With an increase in the size and number of lymphocytes, the body is better able to fight the disease. So usually, again, the doctor examines the patient, he'll know, and if he feels that he cannot take care of this, whatever the problem is, he will do a referral either to their uh, physician or to a specialist. Now, paranasal sinuses, 
are air containing spaces within the skull that communicate with the nasal cavity. And the function of the sinuses include producing mucus, making the bones of the skull lighter, providing resonance that helps produce sound. And the sinuses are named for the bones in which they are located. The maxillary sinuses are the largest of the paranasal sinuses. The frontal sinuses are located with the, within the forehead, just right above both eyes. The ethmoid sinuses are irregularly shaped air cells separated from the orbital cavity by a very thin layer of bone. And the sphenoid sinuses are located close to the optic nerves where an infection may damage vision. So take a look at this picture when you get a chance so you can see where the sinuses are. Now, when we do x-rays, and of course, we're nowhere close to that, uh, but when we do x-rays, you will also see on the x-rays how the sinuses highlight, highlight up on an x-ray. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to x-rays. All righty. So I know that was a long lecture. And it was a lot of information, but you can replay this video over and over again if you like. And of course, you have your Kindle, you do your workbook, and you can uh, basically replay 